right, let's get this party started. Our, uh, our next speaker is an award-winning accessibility advocate and co-leader of the Accessibility Seattle Meetup and is here to talk about our duty to provide safe and accessible experiences to all of our users. Everybody, please give it up for Marcy Sutton. Well, let's get this party started. Welcome. How about some respect and connection and tolerance, inclusion, diversity? These are really important issues, not just of our time, but of all time. I'm Marcy Sutton, as Ken mentioned. I'm here to talk to you about JavaScript and civil rights because I care about people and I care about the experiences that we're creating working for people other than ourselves because there's all different kinds of people in the world. Um, I work as a senior front-end engineer for an accessibility company called DQ Systems where I build tools for web developers to make the web more accessible. You can find my slides online at marcysutton.com slash seattlejs2017, and you can find me on Twitter at any time to chat about accessibility at Marcy Sutton. What are civil rights? Well, in a nutshell, they're the rights of individuals to receive equal treatment and to be free from unfair treatment or discrimination. So to be able to live a life and not be discriminated against and to have the laws on your side to back that up so that you get this fair treatment and you aren't suffering from discrimination. Some aspects of civil rights, the most important one to me is this protection from discrimination. So you shouldn't be discriminated against checking out a book at the library because of the color of your skin or because you ride in a wheelchair. You shouldn't be not considered for a job because of your gender or your age. If for some reason you end up in police custody, you should be able to keep your physical and mental integrity. You have that civil right. You have a right to safety and privacy and the most slippery of them all, freedom of speech. But you know what doesn't belong here is hate. All of these things need to work together, including that slippery freedom of speech, so that we're not degrading people's civil rights. It's a very important thing, and it didn't just start with us. Civil rights are about equal protection under the law, and it's important to remember that people fought for this. You know, this is kind of bubbling up in our lives now, but in times throughout history, people have had to fight for their civil rights. In the 1960s, people moving north from the south to get away from segregation where they'd have to explain to their kids why you can't use that drinking fountain or go into that public restroom. When they moved north, they still had to fight for equality in housing. So in this picture, people in New Jersey are picketing for equal rights to housing. In the 1960s and 70s, women feminists marched all over the, the country demanding equal jobs and equal pay, educational opportunities, and the photo here is by American photojournalist Betty Lane, who documented the feminist, uh, gay, feminist and gay rights movements. More recently in Europe, uh, people from the European Disability Forum protested outside of the European Parliament in Brussels, demanding that accessibility legislation make a more inclusive environment across Europe. Nothing about us without us. They want to have a seat at the table and have their rights represented um, to promote freedom of movement and access from the top down in the EU. So as engineers and designers and you know, all the roles that we play in technology, we have a duty to protect our users' rights to access safety and privacy. I'm gonna tell you how we can do that with tools. Not just talk about these lofty ideals, but to actually put them into practice. So we, we're here at Seattle JS. We probably all love JavaScript. Uh, the reasons I love JavaScript are that it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We can count on at least ES5 being deployed all over. And that makes it pretty helpful. You can count on it. Um, it's pivotal and modern, meaning it can take a, an old school synchronous page reloading application and make it feel more modern. To make it so that you're you know, sending off requests without actually re refreshing the page. So it can be a pretty important technology to add to a website. So today, I'm gonna do my best to do this topic justice, but this is just the start. Uh, but I'm gonna talk to you about how JavaScript can apply to our users' accessibility. It's obviously what I do for a living, so I care about that a lot. Uh, but we're also gonna talk about safety, privacy, a little bit on security, and then when you put all of this together, you're enabling user freedom. When you're giving someone a safe way to access an application, 
they aren't having to go tell someone their PIN number to their bank account. Like, we're enabling independence and freedom by making things more accessible. So it's a super important concept. So to dig, dig in a little bit to accessibility specifically, it's really about freedom from discrimination. So being able to go to the library or vote or pay your, your bills online and to not be discriminated against when you're just trying to live your life. That's all people are asking for. So Seattle's bus system is a great example of how they have these ramps. And sometimes you're in a hurry at rush hour and you have to wait for that ramp to go down. But that means that people have this equal access to commute on the bus just like you. Uh, and it's, so it's super important, not only in the offline world, but in the digital world, that we consider these types of uh, removal of barriers that are getting in people's way. So on the web, accessibility applies just as much it, as it does in the offline world. And really, it's about creating experiences that don't prevent people from using them if they have a disability. So not only using these web experiences, but also contributing to the web. So using tools that we build and really considering that people might have disabilities but still want to contribute. So accessibility and disabilities, they're really all about people. So to really motivate, you know, who are we even doing this for, let's talk about some people with disabilities. And there's a great um, intro to this on the webaim.org website. But the first group I'll talk about are people with vision disabilities. So if you're born blind or you have degenerative vision loss or maybe you're colorblind, that might impact how you use the web. You might need a screen reader or bolder colors or high contrast mode. People with hearing disabilities might be born deaf or lose their hearing over time, so they need media content to be consumable in a text format. So think of transcripts, closed captioning. That can really equal the playing field for education, consuming podcasts, all kinds of things like that. Some people have motor and physical disabilities where they can't use a mouse, perhaps. They need to use the keyboard or something called a switch device. Um, and so that really impacts your human-computer interaction if you have limited mobility. And people with cognitive disabilities, there's a whole spectrum of people uh, who might have learning disabilities or autism. Um, there's so many different groups of people that this is just a, a short list of some of the disabilities that people have. And they might fit into more than one category because people are different all over the world. So if that doesn't quite resonate with you, if you're like, eh, that's not me, that's not my customer, maybe think of it in a bit more selfish way, practically speaking, that it could be you. You could break your arm. You could have a baby in one arm temporarily. So you could go from not feeling like you have a reason to care about accessibility to all of a sudden you might have a situational or even a permanent disability come up. It can happen in an instant. And Microsoft has a great inclusive design toolkit where you can go and learn how to position accessibility in this sort of way. So for me, accessibility and this whole civil rights idea is about putting my values to work and helping people. Because who are we building stuff for anyway? We're not, we shouldn't be only building for ourselves or people who look and act just like us. We are putting things out in the world for customers, for people to use. So let's look at a, an example of something that was not built with accessibility in mind. And I'm just going to let this video play. It's a demo of the Virgin America website. You may have seen this before. But I want to show you what it's like when something gets launched without a single thought to accessibility. No audio. OK, well, I'll just talk it through. How about that? OK. OK, so what's happening here, besides my uh, audio excitement, um, is that we're looking at Virgin America with the, ver the voiceover screen reader running. And you go through all of these controls that really haven't been built for accessibility. So when we watch what happens, um, it's going through the navigation. You go to these radio buttons and just skip right by them. They were built with divs, with click handlers. They aren't accessible at all. So you keep going through to try and book a city. And when I choose uh, Los Angeles, it scrolls the window and it has a banner up at the top that says, OK, you've booked a flight. But then when I hit tab again, it jumped me back up. So the problem was that they scrolled the window for a visual experience but totally forgot about the keyboard users and screen reader users. So when I'm trying to 
uh, use this experience, I have no idea what got selected. There's buttons in here that aren't really labeled. And so what happened was this got launched and everyone touted it as very slick and beautiful. But all these people were getting left behind. It's like not only, you know, we're not saying this just because, you know, we think it should be accessible. It's actually preventing people from booking airline tickets. So that's a pretty important thing to consider when you're building a product. So I'll show you another example that was built with better accessibility. Um, th that's another platform. So booking an airline ticket is pretty important. Being able to get an education is also very important. So there's a website uh, called Blackboard, and they have a learn application that's very JavaScript heavy. And each layer that comes in um, is essentially like a modal dialogue layer. Um, and you may have seen JavaScript applications that load content like that. So in this application, they've done a really good job at handling focus management. And so it's got a skip link. You can go uh, past all of this navigation on the left and have it send you directly into the content. So I'm navigating through the web page. VoiceOver is announcing everything that I land on. And when that layer opens, they sent my focus into it. So then when I hit tab again, I'm in the correct place. Whereas on Virgin America, they scrolled the window, but they didn't actually send my focus. So there's a big difference in the interaction here. So if I keep going through this, ap this application, there's a number of little icon buttons and things that are actually labeled uniquely. So for a screen reader user, they'll know, oh, this settings button is for this thing, and this settings button is for something else, even though they look identical. There's some hidden controls that I wish that they would not hide on hover or focus, but they're there. You can reach them from the keyboard. And my focus is sent into a new layer, and I can go and create a new document completely with the keyboard. I haven't touched my mouse or my trackpad at all. And so what I really like is that they've equaled the playing field for people to go and get an education and to have it be accessible. So that's a way better experience. So some considerations for building UIs. Start with accessible HTML, because it is accessible by default, but somehow we mess that up. And I'm talking about forms, you know, image, alt text, like real basics of HTML. And if you're teaching HTML, teach people about accessible, uh, interactive HTML. Add support for the keyboard. Make sure you can reach and operate everything from, without using your mouse. Like maybe you should do a no mouse Friday and just get rid of it and try to navigate with the keyboard only and see where you are on the screen. Similarly, uh, focus management. In that Blackboard application, they were actually programmatically sending focus into those new layers, and it makes it so that you're in the right spot. You're not stuck behind that layer. You could work on localization. If you're really putting out a global app, letting someone personalize and localize means that they can use it in the way that they need to. And then lastly, if you're building a, a JavaScript-heavy application, consider some screen reader updates. So on Virgin America, they had a big banner up at the top that could easily be announced in a screen reader using something called an ARIA Live region. So a little bit of accessibility in JavaScript, uh, some keyboard events. If you use a button element, this is like my tip number one for accessibility, is that it's focusable and it will fire click events. So start with that. If you're putting a click, on a, a click event on a div, the hair should raise up on the back of your neck and you should go, wait a minute, there's probably a better element for this and it's probably a button. So you can bind a click event and then handle it, do whatever you need to do with it. If you absolutely must make a custom control for some reason, uh, you can do a lot more work by uh, adding a tab index of zero and a roll of button. Um, and then in addition to the click event, you need a key down event because clicks don't fire from div elements. Um, so if you absolutely must do that, just recognize you have to do a little bit more work. So if you're seeing this thing called a role and going, what is that? Um, that's part of this uh, set of standard attributes for specifying accessibility information called ARIA. And ARIA is things like a role, uh, which is, uh, what does this thing do? Is it a checkbox? Is it a radio button? Um, and then what state is it in? So if you want to communicate to a screen reader that your custom checkbox is checked, you can do ARIA-check of true or false. And then what's the nature of it? What type of checkbox is that? Is it the one that's gonna unsubscribe you from spam email? Because I think a screen reader user might wanna know if they're opting into email without realizing it. So an ARIA label is a great property to add on there. But you should absolutely reach for the native thing first. 
I'm only telling you about this so that you know that that's a tool that you can have in your toolbox, and that's what it does. Um, but the native checkbox, pick that first, because it's a lot less work. A great tool for browser debugging, so if you're kind of venturing into this accessibility world and you like geeking out on tools like I do, um, the Chrome Accessibility Inspector that's in, I think it's in Chrome Stable now, but you have to enable it. Um, it will show you, when you inspect an element, all of its accessibility properties, which previously was kind of just this under the hood thing that you had to guess at, and it made it a lot harder to get it correct. So now you have a tool in Chrome, you can go and inspect this stuff, so that's pretty helpful. If you're really getting into software testing, which I think is an important way to integrate accessibility into your projects, uh, you can test for things like focus management. So in that Blackboard app, you bet they had tests for focus management, because if someone on your team breaks that feature, you kind of want to know. <laughs> so you could cover that in a test. And I have an example here of a bottom sheet from um, Angular Material 2, where they are checking that focus is sent into the first item when it opens using Selenium WebDriver. And you can, there's a number of ways you can test for that, but basically you just want to assert that the correct element is focused after you open it. I work on an API called AxCore. This is another really helpful tool. Um, I think it's pretty awesome, because I used it every day before going to work on the team. But it's a JavaScript library that you can use in your tests. Um, you can also use the browser extensions to audit things for accessibility and help you catch those easy uh, mistakes that sometimes we make, where maybe we misspell an ARIA attribute, or we forgot alt text, or whatever. Having a tool automate that and point it out to you can be really helpful. So to get it on the command line, you can find AxCore on NPM and just run an NPM install AxCore. And then our API method ax.run allows you to specify which element you want to test against. It will default to the document. You can pass it any number of options and then a callback function. Um, and then once that has returned results to you, you can assert things. You can expect that there is no accessibility violations or whatever you want to write your test on. You could scope it to a certain component and check only that. Um, and this will help you with that really low-hanging fruit that will free you up for more complex tasks. We can't catch everything with automated testing, but it's a really good start. So there's another tool called Axe WebDriver JS. If you do want to integrate Axe Core with WebDriver, um, you can get that on NPM as well. The Axe Core results object, um, it just tells you what exactly failed. So things like forms, alt text, and the like. So to learn more about Axe Core, you can go to axe-core.org. And we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, we just launched our Shadow DOM pre-release yesterday, so that's pretty exciting. So let's talk about safety. I mean, accessibility is really important to me, but I also want to make sure I'm not impinging on someone's safety and their right to safety. You may remember from a couple of years ago uh, the animated GIF that was sent to a reporter on Twitter maliciously. Uh, Kurt Eichenwald has epilepsy, and when he received this tweet, it had a flashing GIF on it, and it also had the text, I hope this causes you to have a seizure, so in court, it's pretty obvious it was meant to do harm. And he actually won the court case. He took this person to court, and everyone else who sent him flashing gifts and legal action was brought against them, because it's a weapon. If you're causing someone to have a catastrophic seizure, that's horrible. Um, and I think Twitter has since made it so that gifts don't autoplay, or you can change that setting. Um, but are we building something similar into our own apps and opening up users for safety issues? So I'm gonna show you an app. I'm gonna give a bit of a motion sickness warning because it's going to autoplay when I change the slide. Um, but it was a site that went around recently that it's, it's cool, it's experimental, but there's some accessibility issues. And when I play it, maybe you can tell me what you think they are. So the interface is turning and the colors are changing. Um, and if you have nausea or vertigo or a really bad hangover, it can make you feel terrible. I'm speaking from experience on that one. So what we need to do is provide affordances, like put a little toggle that lets someone turn it off so that they aren't made sick. So there was a link to go essentially do a PDF version of that, it, but I think we could integrate it better. I think we could like, just make a way to turn this off. And there's a really helpful tool for that. Uh, the new thing in Safari is called prefers reduced motion. 
and it's both a media query and a match media option, so you can use it in JavaScript as well as CSS, to give the user some way on their hardware to opt out of these animations. So on iOS and OS X Sierra, there is this reduce motion setting where a user can actually go and say, I don't want this animation. And the nice thing about that, having it be controlled from your actual code, is that they won't ever see the flashing thing. They won't ever be opened up for that risk of feeling sick for the rest of the day because they already have it set up on their device. So that's pretty awesome. And you can go and vote it up on, like Mozilla has an issue open for this. Um, I've included the link in my slides, so if you want to go and help us out, give a vote for prefers reduced motion in Firefox, the more browsers we get to adopt this, the more we'll have this cross-platform tool for users to opt out of things that make them sick. And then we can, as developers, build that support into our apps. Pretty awesome. So Giphy is a cool website with a lot of um, animated GIFs. They play automatically, and depending on your, how you're feeling that day or, or all the time, it might be a kind of a hard platform to use. They do have an autoplay toggle button, um, but it does not impact the, uh, the canvas video that they have in the middle, because that's just slightly different technology. So the autoplay doesn't completely work on that site. So for that, I found a cool extension called GIF Jam. You can install it as a user, so to protect yourself, you can install this in your browser uh, to just prevent anything from auto-playing. And it'll give you little controls in your browser so that you can be ready for it or just not see it. And so Giphy is a bit of an extreme example because we're going there for the animated GIFs, but what if you're just dropping one into a blog post or dropping one into a, a news site? I mean, they're everywhere. So I think we, there's some things we can do as developers, but then as users, we can also protect ourselves with tools like GIF Jam. So Giphy, if I turn that GIF Jam thing on, it's up in the browser. Um, it will let the current like, set of frames finish, and then the next GIF that comes up, like Homer going into the hedge, you just see the first frame of everything. And that's giving the user a bit more control over what's playing in their browser. So on video, a uh, bit of a uh, message from the Twitterverse. Dear every web developer in the history of ever and the future to come, don't autoplay anything ever. I know we love to make our marketing folks happy sometimes, but just put controls. Like, let people turn stuff off um, because it can be very distracting. Brave, the browser, is doing something really cool with this, where they have a preference to let you opt out of autoplaying media. And I would love to see this in more browsers, because this is giving the user control at the platform and browser level to opt out of things that might make them sick. So I'm just advocating for more controls, more options, so that users can personalize and have a safer browsing experience. So let's talk about privacy. When I was doing research for this talk, I went and read an article on The Guardian um, about whatever I was reading that day, and there was an auto-playing advertisement in the mobile browser. And I guess they'd pegged me as their demographic for selling yogurt, because I saw the same ad pop up on Instagram like five minutes later. So there's some ads, creepy ad networks going on here. But not being able to opt out of this autoplay on my mobile browser not only like completely jolted me out of reading the article, it's also eating up my data plan without my consent. So that's kind of a double whammy of problems where the safety and the privacy are kind of coming together to create this perfect storm of ads. So I'm sorry if, some, if you guys work on ads, but this is the user experience that we're presented with. So websites leak our data. Depending on what third-party tools you're using, it is known that the data that we are collecting on the web, that we are often just, we're giving it up because we're browsing the web or we're signing up for services for free, um, those tracking cookies are being feeding your data to ad networks. They're measuring your behavior and in some cases collecting a profile on you. That's how I'm getting the same ad across networks. Um, and so it's, it's pretty creepy. If you go and read about this, um, it's, I feel complicit in this process as a web developer and as a consumer even. So that's something that we should be more aware of. When I was also preparing for this talk, I just had this feeling that I was doing something wrong. And on my website, I had the Discuss application for collecting comments on my WordPress site. 
And I'm going to let this video play of the profiler in my Chrome browser of how many third-party resources were being loaded when I had this comment application on my website. So I load the page. We see all these CDNs loading. And if I go and drill down into each of these CDNs, we can go and see it's got like three different top-level domains it loads things from. And then those pull in more resources. And all of a sudden, it's loading all this stuff that I did not know I was signing up for. It might have some language in the terms of service that I skipped over, because that's what people do. Um, but once I really saw what this was doing on my website, I decided that I didn't want my users to be, have, to be participating in that, because um, it wasn't something that I wanted to sign them up for. So I disabled it. Uh, you can go back to using WordPress comments. You can, for now, I just disabled it completely. Um, so hopefully there's some alternative, and there may even be a setting in Discuss that you can opt out of some of this stuff, but how many websites are collecting our data out there for the convenience of not having to log in to a site to make a comment? So the important takeaway here to me is that free software, things that you sign up for, like Facebook, Google, Discuss, often mean that you're the product, or that the person using it, uh, the end user, is the product. So not to be confused with like the free software foundation idea of free software. I'm talking about the services that you sign up for for free and then give them all of your data, you are the product. And if we're all OK with that, that's fine. But I think we definitely need to know what we're getting our users into, especially when we're loading third-party resources that are then sending their data off to be collected. And then we're kind of contributing to this, um, these ad profiles without even realizing it. So there's a couple of cool projects I saw, uh, a bit uh, subvertive. There's one, it's actually called Subvertise. And it was in response to the FCC uh, repealing privacy controls, which it was, yeah, takes me back to a, a couple of months ago. That was, there's a new thing every day. But this, in particular, uh, got, felt really creepy that our ISPs can then sell our browsing data to advertisers. So this project. <laughs> goes and randomly visits a bunch of websites just to like muddy up your data. <laughs> and they don't recommend doing it on a mobile connection. Uh, I mean, they really are going and hitting random websites just to like obfuscate what you're actually doing on the internet, which I thought was kind of an, an interesting take on this problem. One that might be a bit more practical is called sh uh, Sheriff or Sharif. And it is a, a set of sharing buttons that you can use that aren't the standard embeddable widgets that you get from Twitter or Facebook. Um, they are carefully crafted so that you can share content from a website, but not be siphoning your user's data at the same time. So it's a bit of a safer method to provide that service if you really want someone to be able to share your content by not leaking their data at the same time. So there's some really interesting things to read out there about what's actually being tracked. Um, websites, I mean, any website you visit with JavaScript on it where you're typing into a form, theoretically, they could be capturing your, your data. I mean, you're visiting the website. That's kind of a, something you're agreeing to do when you go to visit a website. Um, but there is a cool article from Naked Security about you know, what we can even do about that, what is a problem there. Um, Facebook recently was using what educated guesses to try and get people who may have a disability to confirm that they have a disability. And this is a huge privacy leak. Um, because people who are blind don't really want to be tracked on the web. They don't want to be walking around with a big white flag going, hey, I'm blind. Uh, because then often that can be used against them. They'll be given like some text-only version of a website. Like not everyone is going to do that responsibly. So the disability community is really hesitant to be confirmed as having a disability. Um, so be aware of this. Like, I know we want to make a better experience, but we need to just try and make everything inclusive without trying to pigeonhole people into these, um, confirming they have disabilities. If you want to read more about that, um, you can read a great post from Marco Ziha. He works at Mozilla on why he thinks screen reader detection on the web is a bad thing. And this is really kind of accessibility and privacy kind of coming together. And so often these topics aren't often a silo. They're all interconnected. So here's one thing you can do. Like many of you, I had uh, Google Analytics on my website, which is collecting data on users. So this is something I didn't know, that by, reading the term, <laughs> by not reading the terms of service, I didn't realize that you are obligated to have a privacy policy and a way to opt out. 
So Google Analytics, you know, we're not necessarily using it for anything bad, but you can be more responsible by using it just by adding a page on your website that says, hey, this is my privacy policy. I'm using Google Analytics to try and improve my site on platforms that people actually use. Just say what you're using it for. And then in WordPress, there's a, um, a plugin you can use to easily let users opt out. And that way, they aren't being tracked. It's up to them to make that decision. So that was something new. I didn't know. I had had Google Analytics on my site for years, and I had no idea. So a little tip for you for privacy. So to recap, accessibility is a civil right. I think it's a, a pretty base concept that I really want to drive home. Like, it's not just, we're not just doing it for the feels. It is a civil right where people need to live independent, productive lives. Safety and privacy, too, and these are all kind of wrapped up together. We want to make sure we're not putting out experiences that are leaking people's data and causing them harm. Because really, we're building things for people, and our work impacts people's lives. Sometimes we don't realize it. Maybe we don't do enough usability testing to know how people actually use our applications. But at large, we're making a really big impact on the world, so I want us to do it as responsibly as we can. And we can make a difference. As cheesy as that sounds, I wake up every morning knowing that I'm contributing something good to the world. And I think we have these interactions at work where we, every, every day we can kind of chip away at it, hopefully. So thanks for having me, Seattle.js. Uh, you can find my slides on GitHub and on my website. And I hope you have a great conference. Thanks.